Hey everybody, welcome back to the NPTE podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate on test day. So we do have a practice question for you today related to the endocrine and metabolic system. So this is one of the smaller or other systems on the exam, certainly something not to forget, but worth spending some time on. But as always, I do say you should study proportionately. 75% of the test coming from the big three systems. So you'll need to spend more time on cardio, neuro, and musculo. But before we get to the practice question, just a quick reminder, check out ptfinalexam.com slash podcast, where you can stay up to date, up to date with all of our cheat sheets and, and offerings. It's a great place to find tips and tricks to get you ready for test day. So be sure to check that out, ptfinalexam.com slash podcast, where you can find out all the free stuff that we have to offer over at PT Final Exam. And as we get started, I haven't said it in a while, but just a, a reminder that, uh, or just if no one has said it to you today, let me say thank you. Thank you for the efforts you put into this. I know that as you are studying, it's a difficult task. It's arduous. There are some of you who are on multiple attempts. I recognize that it is, it's a difficult process. It is something that is very burdensome. And in fact, that's one of the things I talk with students about is that there are three main challenges that a person has when they are attacking or preparing for the NPTE. One is to learn new content. The other is to gain, so retain what you know, gain new material. And then the final one or the third point is perhaps the most difficult. It's to keep a positive mental attitude and positive momentum during the whole process. Just because we do tend to avoid things that we hate doing, we tend to so the more time we have, the more time we waste. It's one of those things where you just have to stay engaged and moving forward and just recognize it's a difficult process. So, so thank you for what you do. And remember that it will benefit not just you, but your patients' lives for many, many years to come. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about our practice question. Again, this is related to the metabolic and endocrine system. There, there are approximately five to seven questions here. So again, not a not a robust section on the exam. However, certainly worth knowing, and they will be asking you things that are key to a, an entry-level therapist, things that you'll likely encounter in your first year of PT practice. So keep that in mind. Uh, granted, there may be some things that do feel a little bit like they're out of left field. Remember, they are testing you on things that are common, things that you are likely to encounter to make you a safe and effective PT. So without further ado, let's go ahead and go through our practice question. Again, those of you watching the YouTube version of this, you can read along. If you're just listening to it, I would encourage you to pause the audio or ponder or consider what you would put as the correct answer here. Here we go. Which of the following signs and symptoms is most indicative of hyperglycemia? Which of the following signs and symptoms is most indicative of hyperglycemia? One, acetone breath. Two, pallor or sweating. Three, shaky, hungry, dizziness, and four, shallow respirations. So we have one, acetone breath, two, pallor, sweating, three, shaky, hungry, dizziness, and four, shallow respirations. And again, the question is, which of the following signs and symptoms is most indicative of hyperglycemia? So the correct answer on this one is that acetone breath, also known as a fruity breath, this is, it's like rotting fruit, uh, another description would be that it's like acetone. These are the ketone bodies. You can see the same suffix there. Ketone bodies create an acetone type smell. Acetone like fingernail polish remover or or paint thinner, like that type of a thing. It is meant, or sorry, the scent or aroma is quite distinct. And so these would be the, this would be a sign of hyperglycemia, having acetone breath. Other things that would include would be included on the list of signs for hyperglycemia it would include lethargy, dulled sensations, thirst, nausea, flushed skin, hyperpnea. We'll talk about that in a moment. So Kussmaul respirations, polyuria, all of these are signs of hyperglycemia. All these other signs, pallor, sweating, shaky, hungry, dizzy, shallow respirations, all of these are signs of hypoglycemia. So hyperglycemia has that fruity or acetone breath Whereas these other ones, pallor, sweating, shaky, hungry, dizzy, shallow respirations, all of these are signs of hypoglycemia. So just a note about Kussmaul respirations. This is obviously also related to, to what we would consider metabolic, al ma <sighs> metabolic acidosis. So one of the, the compensations for metabolic acidosis. So when a person goes into hyperglycemia, they start to create ketone bodies and it creates 
what we know as ketoacidosis. So it's a very acidic environment. So this means that the pH is reduced, they become very acidic. And so the best way to compensate for that in the short term is to go into hyperpnea or excessive deep respirations. These are called Kussmaul respirations, so rapid deep breathing. This is one of the signs of hyperglycemia, Kussmaul respirations. The other thing is that because they're in hyperglycemia, they will experience what's called polyuria, meaning that they're trying to flush out all of the glucose out of their blood, blood system, <laughs> out of their blood, out of, the, out of the body, out of the circulatory system. Plus, they will be very thirsty so they tend, they want to dilute all of the blood glucose and then pee it all out. And so therefore, someone with hyperglycemia, they tend to have polyuria and polydipsia. So multiple trips to the bathroom and polydipsia, a excessive thirst, in addition to hyperpnea, which would be Kussmaul respirations. So these are all the signs of hyperglycemia. Uh, just of note, if you want to know the actual values on this, typically hyperglycemia is diagnosed as above 250 milligrams per deciliter. So this would be, so as you check, check blood glucose, you're checking for milligrams per deciliter. Typically, you want to have the patient around 100. That is your typical or average, average uh, uh, blood glucose. Now, granted, it will be slightly different if you take it fasting versus a casual blood glucose. That being said, typically your safe glucose levels are between 100 and 250. It can be slightly lower if a person is a type one, young, young person, type one diabetic. It can be as low as 90, uh, uh, possibly even as low as 70 if they're asymptomatic. However, your safe level is typically around 100 or more. Once you get above 250, that would be classified as hyperglycemia. And then the risk for diabetic ketoacidosis is extreme once you get above the 300 milligrams per deciliter. So again, if you were to remember one thing about the values, 100 is your target. Once you get above 250, then it starts to be cautionary. Once you're above 300, then you'd have no exercise permitted just because there's such a high risk for diabetic ketoacidosis. All right, so there you go. There's a question about diabetes and hyperglycemia. Be sure to check out ptfinalexam.com slash podcast to find out all the other cheat sheets and info that we have for you for free. Also, if you haven't yet, be sure to leave us a review over on Google Play, iTunes, Spotify, wherever it is you listen to this podcast. And in the meantime, have fun studying. Keep a grin on your chin. Will crane fist pumps all around. And I'll catch you in the next episode. Thanks. Thanks.